Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get started. So today we're doing section 9.1. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the point of the section is yet. It's a very important section. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'll tell you what the section is about a little bit later. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to teach you how to calculate something because this thing that I'm going to teach you how to calculate is going to show up in the formulas that we're going to use later on today. Okay, so bear with me. I'll tell you the whole point of the lecture, but I'll tell you in like, you know, a few minutes from now. Okay, so what we have to learn right now is how to calculate something. Um, and it's going to look like the notation for the thing we're calculating is going to be Z. And there's going to be a little number down here as a subscript. You're going to see things like Z.05 or Z.029 or something like this. So, so this is some weird notation because it shows up in a formula we're going to see later. So it's got the letter Z and it's got a subscript. Okay, and the subscript is going to be some, some real tiny number there. What are we asking you to find when we ask you to find such a thing? So when you see Z with a little number as a subscript, well, Z stands for, you know, standard normal distribution. So you're gonna be using the standard normal distribution. You know, that's the one uh, with the bell curve and the mean is zero, standard deviation is one, that one. Z with a little number on it, that's gonna be a number on the axis on the bottom. So the thing we're gonna learn how to calculate right now, you're gonna be looking for a number on the bottom. For a standard normal distribution, the number in the middle is zero here. And, but this thing we're looking for is always going to be a positive number. So it's going to be somewhere on this side, okay, of the, of the number line on the bottom. So you're looking for some number down here on the bottom. Whatever that number is, I don't know what it is yet, but the notation is Z with a little number down here. And what do I know about this number? The person who made up this number said, here's the deal. I don't know what the number down here is yet, but... Here's what I know. If I go from that number up to the curve and I shade to the right, the person who made up this notation said you always have to shade to the right. So you go up to the curve and shade to the right. The area that I shaded is just the subscript. Okay, so just the subscript alone is the area. So there's like if I ask you to find like Z.02, so that number is some number down here. I don't know it yet. So I'm going to show you how to find it in a minute. So I don't know what the number is, but it's a number, so anytime you see Z with a little subscript, we're looking for a number on the number line on the bottom. But what do I know about that number? I know if I go up to the curve and shade to the right, the area is, if you ignore the letter Z and just look at the subscript, that's the area. So the area is 0.02. So the, we're looking for the number on the number line where the area to the right of it is 0.02. So if you just look at the subscript, that's an area, okay? But we're not looking for 0.02, we're looking for Z.02. That's a number on the bottom for which the area to its right is 0.02. I'll we're gonna do six examples so you can see how to calculate this thing because it's very important. So let me go ahead and read this here. It says, let Z be the random variable with the standard normal distribution. When you see Z with the little number on the bottom, it's a number on the Z axis. It's also always positive. So it's always on the right side of zero, okay? Um, for which the area to the right of it is the subscript. If you just look at the subscript, that's an area. It's the area to the right of the number that we're looking for. And here's a picture again. So the number we're looking for is on the bottom. So it's on this number line on the bottom somewhere. It's on the right side of zero. And what I know about that number is that if, I, if I go from that number up to the curve and shade to the right, the area is just the subscript. The area is the little number that you see as a subscript. Okay, so that's the story. That's what this notation is. And again, we need to know how to calculate this because it's going to show up in the formula we're going to see later. So here we go. Six examples on calculating this stuff. So we're going to calculate these six things. Let's start with this first one. <coughs> for all of them, what you're going to do is you're going to draw a picture first. So we're looking for Z.025. So what you do is you draw standard normal distribution. So some kind of bell curve like this and you put a zero here in the middle because standard normal distribution, the mean is zero, you'll label it Z distribution. Okay. Now the number I'm looking up, Z.025, it's here somewhere. Okay, so again, it's gonna be on, the number we're looking for is on the number line somewhere and it's on the right side of zero. So just somewhere on the right side of zero, you're gonna put a tick mark and I'm looking for this number. I don't know it yet. Right now, I only know its notation. So the notation is Z.025. So I'm just going to write it down, Z.025. And when I figure out the answer, I'll put it below there. But what do I know about the number that I'm trying to find? I know if I go from that number up to the curve, 
and shade to the right. You always shade to the right. This area here is just the subscript. So we just look at the subscript, 0 0.025 is this area. Okay, and we have to find the number down here. So a couple things to tell you. First of all, normally when we use the Z table, here's the Z table, normally it's backwards. Normally you know this number and you're trying to find this number. You're trying to find an area. So the number down here would be on the edge. And then the area you're trying to find is in the middle. The middle numbers are areas. But this time it's backwards. This time you're given the area and you're looking for the number on the bottom. So basically we're given a number in the middle this time and our answer is gonna be on the edge. So we're gonna be using the table backwards today because we're gonna be given areas instead of looking for areas. Okay, that's the first thing. We'll use the table backwards. The second thing, um, is the areas that are in the table are areas to the left of a number, but this is the area to the right of a number. Okay. So it's a little weird. The person who made up this notation says you have to shade to the right, but if you can use a table, you need to know the area to the left. So that adds an extra step before we can just look up the number. So what you have to do to, in order to look up this number, first thing you have to do is you have to find the, besides what draw the picture, like we've done, what you need to do next is you need to find the area to the left. I'm talking about from this line to the left. I don't want to shade the entire area, but I'm talking about basically the unshaded area. You got to find that area first because you need to know the area to the left in order to use the table. But the way you find the area to the left, it's real easy because the area to the left of the number plus the area to the right of the number has to be one because the area to the whole curve has to be one. So the area to the left is going to be one minus this 0 0.025. So you do that first. You first find the area to the left then you're going to look for 0.975 in the middle of the table. So you have to, it, this is a little bit annoying. You're going to have to scan through these numbers until you find 0.975. It's got to be 0.975 exactly. It can't be close. It has to be exactly 0.975. And after you look for a little while, let me look to and see. Okay, here it is right here. 0 0.9750. That's exactly 0 0.975. The next digit is zero. This is not 0.975 because there's another digit afterwards, okay? So 0.9750 is 0.975. So you look for that number in the middle. Then you go to the left, get this number 1.9, and then you get the next digit by going from that number to the top. This number is 1.96. So Z.025 is 1.96. It's not an area, okay? So it's a number on the number line. It could be well, it's always going to be positive. It doesn't have to be between zero and one. It's usually between zero and three because, you know, the table doesn't go much past three, zero to 3.5 or whatever. Okay, we'll do other examples. Any questions on part A of example one? Okay, let's do another one. Z.017. Again, to find Z with a little subscript like that, first thing you do, draw a picture of the Z distribution. Put a dotted line here, put a zero here, label it Z distribution. So you start off like that. Now the number we're looking for, again, it's gonna be on the, this is a number line on the bottom. It's gonna be on the number line and it's gonna be on the right of zero. So somewhere on the right of zero, put a tick mark and label it Z.017. I don't know what it is yet. I just know the notation for it right now, but it's some, some positive number we're looking up. And now in order to look it up, you go through these steps. First thing is, the thing I know about this number is if I go from that number up to the curve and shade to the right, again, whoever made up this notation said you always shade to the right, then the area that I've shaded is the subscript. So this area is 0 0.017. Notice I'm not putting a Z here, okay? I'm just writing the subscript, 0 0.017. So the area is 0 0.017. The number I'm looking for is called Z, 0 0.017. What is the Z number where the area to the right is 0 0.017? That's what I'm looking for. Now we want to use the table, but in order to use the table, I need to first find the area to the left of the number. Because again, the way the table is made, uh, the numbers in the middle are areas to the left of a number. So to find the area to the left of this line here, you do one minus 0 0.017, which is 0 0.983. So now you look for 0 0.983 in the middle of the table. I know the Z table has two pages, we're using the positive side because the number we're looking up is always going to be positive. And you're looking for 0 0.983 in the middle. It's got to be there exactly. So 0 0.9830 is what we're looking for. 
And here it is right here, 0 0.9830. It's a little annoying again to look for it in the middle. You have to move around in, in until you find it, but there it is, 0 0.9830. Then the numbers on the edge will give me this number over here. So you go to the edge. So you go to the left edge here to get the 2.1. And you go to the top edge to get the second decimal. This number is 2.12. Any questions? Okay, so we're going to do six examples, but I'm not going to do six examples because you need a lot of practice. There's basically a couple of different situations that can happen. So I'm doing two examples of each situation. So there's the first two examples. Let's go and take a look at the next one and see what happens. So something a little bit different happens here. Z.10. Okay, let's go through it the way we went through these other ones. First thing you do is you draw a picture. So standard normal distribution. Put a zero here, label it Z distribution. Okay. The number I'm looking for, Z.10, is here somewhere. It's on the number line on the right of zero somewhere. I'm going to call it Z.10. But again, I don't know the answer yet. When I find it, I'll put it down there. What do I know about this number that I'm looking for? I know that if I go from the number up to the curve and shade to the right, the area, someone tell me the area. I'm shading in red here. Yes, 0 0.10. 0 0.10, yeah, just the subscript. Don't say the Z, but whatever the subscript is, that's the area, 0.10. Okay, once again, to use the table, though, I need to know the area to the left. That's the way table is, the table is made. We need to know the area to the left. I'm not going to shade the area to the left, but I'll put a little arrow. The unshaded area, you got to find that first. You do 1 minus 0.10 to get that. When you're done, you get 0.9 or 0.90. So you got to look for 0 0.90 in the middle of the table. Now, in the middle of the table, all the numbers have four decimal places. So if I wanted to write it with four decimal places, it'd be 0 0.9000. You got to find 0 0.9000 exactly. Don't don't use this. I'm not talking about this 0.9. Okay, we're looking for a 0.9 somewhere in the middle. After you look for a little while, you're going to find out that it's not there. 0 0.9000 is not there exactly. So in part A and B, the number you're looking for was, was there. Exactly that number you're looking for was there. Great. If it's not there, then what do you do? Well, the answer is, if it's not there, you pick the closest thing to it. So I'm going to go and take a look at this table. And right here, this number is a little bit less than 0 0.9000. And this number is a little bit more than 0 0.900. So this number is in between them somewhere. So when the number is not there exactly... Then there's going to be two numbers, the one's a little bit smaller, one's a little bit bigger, where the number you're looking for is in between somewhere, okay? Two numbers that are right next to each other, this number and this number, they're right next to each other. Okay, so again, one's a little bit smaller than the number I'm looking for, one's a little bit bigger. you got to pick the one that's closer. <clears throat> Which one is closer? Well, let's take a look at the point 8997. This number is three away from this. When I say three away, I really mean 0 0.0003 away. Okay, so it's kind of close. It's three away. This number here, 0 0.9015, is 15 away. That one five at the end shouldn't be there, right? Because this would just be 0 0.9000. So that number is 15 away from the number I'm looking for. So this number is three away. Again, I mean 0 0.0003 away. This number is 15 away. When I say 15 away, I really mean 0 0.0015 away. Which one is closer to 0 0.9000, the 0.8997 or the 0 0.9015? Which one is closer to the one I'm looking up? 0.8997. The 0.8997 is closer. So, okay, so when the number's not there, you pick the closest one. It's not this one. It's this one. So you can use the 0.8997. And then again, go to the left edge and go up to the top to get the answer. Answer is 1.28. So once again, the number you're looking for, if it's in the table, exactly perfect. If it's not, you pick the closest one. We'll do another one like this one. Any questions on part C? Okay, sounds good. Let's go to part D. Z.02. So this is another one like that. Again, you draw a picture. This is standard normal distribution. Okay. 
The number I'm looking for, Z.02, is here somewhere. So you just put a tick mark somewhere on the right of zero on the number line on the bottom. I'm going to label it Z.02, but I don't know the answer yet. That's just the notation for the answer. What I know about this number is if I go from this number up to the curve and shade to the right, this area is the subscript, so 0.02. But you don't look for 0.02 in the table. You got to find the area to the left in order to use the table. So we got to do, so we're looking for the white unshaded area there. You got to do 1 minus 0.02, which gives you 0.98 or 0 0.9800. Okay, we're looking for 0 0.9800 in the table. And again, you look, it's not there. So since the number's not there, we're going to look for the closest thing. What I'm looking for is two numbers that are right next to each other in here. And this is in between them. Okay, that's what we're looking for. So let's see here if I can find it. Okay, I think I got it. So 0 0.9803 and 0 0.9798. Okay, 0 0.9800 is somewhere in between those. Okay, so we have to decide which one of those to use. Okay, these are the two closest numbers to 0 0.9800. One's a little bit smaller, one's a little bit bigger. But I got to know which one is closer. 0.9798 is two away from this. 0.9803 is three away. So which one is closer, the 0.9798 or the 0.9803? The 0.9798. Yes. Okay. So we're not going to be using this one. Okay, we'll use this one. So again, you just go to the edge now, go to the left, and then go to the top. 2.05 is what it is. All right, any questions so far? Okay, we're going to do two more. Because there's a third situation that can come up. So again, if the number you're looking up is on the table, great. If it's not, pick the closest thing. And then there's this third thing that can happen. So let's go ahead and check out what happens here. All right, so once again, to find Z.05, we're gonna draw a standard normal distribution. Zero there, label Z distribution here. The number we're looking for is there somewhere. It's on the number line, on the bottom, on the right of zero. The number is called Z.05, but I don't know what the answer is yet. So we'll go through this, these steps to figure out what the answer is. So you go up to the curve, shade to the right. This area that I'm shading is the subscript. So this area here is 0 0.05. I need to know the area to the left in order to look it up in the table. The area to the left, you find it by doing 1 minus 0.05. So 0 0.95. So we're looking for 0.95 in the table, meaning 0.9500. Okay, exactly 0.95. When you look in the middle of the table, you'll see 0 0.9500 is not there. And when that happens, you pick the closest one. So again, what I'm looking for is two numbers in the table that are right next to each other, where one is a little bit less than this and one's a little bit bigger than this. So the 0.9500 is in between somewhere. And let's see, here it is. So we got 0.9495 and 0 0.9505. And 0 0.9500, this number is a little bit less, and this number is a little bit bigger. So it's trapped in between those two numbers. So we got to decide which one to use. The, the one we use is the closest one. But if you check, 0.9495 is 5 away. What I mean is 0 0.0005 away from this. So it's 0 0.0005 smaller than what I'm looking for. The other number is also 5 away, meaning 0 0.0005 away from this. It's five bigger than the number I'm looking for. So this one is five smaller, this one is five bigger. Which one do you use? You're supposed to pick the closest one, but they're equally close, okay? So when there's two numbers that are equally close, that's a third situation, what are you gonna do? This is what you do. Take this one, the first one, look up the answer, 1.64. This is not the answer, but if you use the 0.9495, the answer would be 1.64. If you use the 0.9505, so you go to the left, you get 1.6 again, and then you get 1.65 here. So which, which one is the right answer? 1.64 or 1.65? The answer is in this situation, what you do is you take those two answers and take the average of them. Okay, so you just add them and divide by two. And you get 1.645. That's the answer to that one.
Okay, let me say the whole story again and we'll do one more example. So if the number that you're looking up, this number here, this area to the left, if it's in the table exactly, then you look up that answer and you're done. If it's not there, you pick the closest one. But in this situation, when there's two numbers that are equally close, look up the two answers you would get from those and take the average. So you add them and divide by two. And that's how you get that one. Questions on part E. All right, let's go to part F. So this is another one like part E. So we'll just practice it one more time. All right. So again, we're looking for a Z with a little number. So you draw a Z distribution, a zero here, label it Z distribution, Z.005. So what I know is it's over here somewhere. It's on the number line, it's positive, it's on the right side of zero. And right now I know the notation for that number is Z.005, but I don't know what it is yet. In order to look at it, in order to figure it out, what you do is you go from there up to the curve and shade to the right. You always shade to the right. The area that I'm shading here is the subscript, 0 0.005. Okay, again, that's the area to the right of a number, but I can't use the table unless I know the area to the left. So I'm going to look up this. I'm going to find the area to the left first. You do 1 minus 0 0.005, which gives you 0 0.995. That means I'm looking up the number 0.995 if I want to write four decimals, because every number here is four decimals, I'm looking for 0 0.9950 in the middle of the Z table. When you look for a while, you'll realize it's not there. So we've got to pick the closest one. And when I look here for 0.995, I'm seeing 0.9949, that's a little bit less, and 0.9951, that's a little bit bigger than 0.995. So 0.9950 is between those two numbers. Which one do I use? I use the closest one, but in this case, they're equally close. 0.9949 is just one away. Really, I mean 0 0.0001 away from this. So this is one smaller than this. The other one, 0.9951, is one away from this as well. It's one bigger. Again, I mean 0 0.0001 bigger than the number I'm looking for. So they're equally close. When they're equally close, which one do you use? Well, you kind of use both of them. Look up both answers and then take the average. So for the 0.9949 number, you go to the left like this, get that 2.5 here, go up 2.57. That's not the answer, but you look up the 0.9949. Then you look up the 0.9951, go to the left, 2.58. Okay, and then you take the average of these numbers. You just add them and divide by two. And the answer is 2.575. All right, that's the answer to that. And that's how you look up Z with a little subscript. Any questions? And now I will tell you what the point of the section is for the day, section 9.1. So basically the first two days of class, the first week of class that we had, we did statistics. This class is called statistics. We did statistics, or I, I kind of told you what kind of problems you want to solve in a statistics class. That was what we worked on first day of class, first week of class. And then we left statistics and went to another subject called probability. It is another subject, but they're really closely connected. Um, probability is the math behind the scenes of statistics problems kind of thing. So we did probability, that was chapter five, six, seven, and eight. And now we're in chapter nine, we're going back to statistics now. We're gonna actually now answer those types of questions that I told you we would, we would answer first day of class. Um, so remember these things. So I'm gonna remind you of some things from first day of class. Every stats problem is about a big group. Uh, we call that big group a population. So it's a, it's a question about a big group. And if you could collect data from the entire big group, you can answer the question and there'd be no problem but it's too big for us to collect data from. So what you do is you collect data from a small part of the group and use that data to try to answer the question. So, and today we're doing percentage problems. So today we're trying to figure out a percentage. So imagine there's some percentage we're trying to figure out and it involves a big group. Like I wanna know the percentage of all Rio Hano students that are married or something like that, okay? So if I don't, in, in any stats problem, you don't actually collect data from the entire big group, but if you did, what would my data look like? What would I ask? If I want to know the percentage of all Riojano students that are married, what I would have to do is talk to every single Riojano student 
and ask if they're married. There's, a, there's way too many people to ask. But if I ask them, the answers they're going to give me are yes, or, yeses and noes. And this is what I call the population data. Okay, population data is a big bag with yeses and noes in it. Okay, it's the answers. It's the collection of all the answers. If I collect the data from every Rihanna student, there's 20,000 Rihanna students, there'd be 20,000 yeses and noes in here. Okay, some yeses, some noes, 20,000 answers total. And I'm trying to figure out P. P is the percentage of yeses in this bag. In other words, the percentage of all Rihanna students that are married. But in a real stats problem, this bag is an imaginary bag of data because we don't actually collect the data. But this number, I'm dying to know, okay? So we're trying to figure out this number. So what do you do in a real life stats problem? What you do is you take a sample. That means you talk to some real Honda students, not all real Honda students, and you ask them if they're married. So you collect data, not from all real Honda students, but just from some of them. Maybe I would ask, you know, all the people in my class or something like that if they're married. Instead of all 20,000 real Honda students, Maybe I talked to like five people, 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, but that's way less than 20,000 people. And that gives me another bag of data, which we call sample data. This data is not an imaginary bag. It's a bag of data that we collected. So we actually do collect this bag and we can calculate the percentage of people here that are married and that's called P hat. The number I'm dying to know, okay, is P. I'm dying to know P but I don't know it, it's unknown. But this I know because I have the data to calculate it. Okay, so, but remember, every stats problem is about a big group. Ultimately, it's this one I'm dying to know, but this is the one I do know. And P hat is my best guess for P. So P would be the percentage of all Rio Hano students that are married, for example. This would be the percentage of all students in my class, for example, that are married, okay? And I would use this number to guess this number. So P hat is known because we have the data to calculate it. P is unknown because we don't have the data to calculate it, but P is the number I'm dying to know. So we're trying to figure that out. Now, first day of class, what I told you is P hat is your best one number guess for P. It's your best guess. I told you it's probably a bad guess, but that's all we can do. We just use the data we have, calculate P hat, and that's gonna be my best guess for P. In other words, if 20% of the students in my class are married, then I'm gonna guess that 20% of all real Honor students are married. Okay, and that's the idea. And that's called a point estimate. We're trying to estimate P. So remember, P is an unknown number, we're trying to guess it. First day of class, we, did, we made bad guesses, and today we're gonna to make good guesses, okay? What was our bad guess? Just use P hat answer. It's a guess, it might be a good guess, um, but that's, that's our guess. So it's a point estimate. Point estimate is a one number guess. Okay. So if I say, what's the percentage of all Rihanna students that are married, you go figure out the percentage of people in your sample that are married and say, oh, I'm going to use that number for P. I think P is 20%. It's a one number guess. You're saying, I think P is 20%. That's it. So that's what a point estimate is. It's a one number guess. And here's the problem with point estimates. We're probably wrong. Okay. If later on someone collects all this data and figures out P and it's 23%, let's say P is 23%, then when you said you think P is 20%, you're wrong now. You're wrong. You're close maybe, okay, but you're wrong. It's too easy to be wrong if you just make a one number guess. So we don't like one number guesses. So instead of a one number guess, we're gonna want an interval guess, okay? So a uh, point estimate guess would be like, I, you know, I think, he is 20%. You're just saying, give me one number. I think it's 20% done. And you're most likely wrong. That's a point estimate guess. Okay, but we're gonna want an interval estimate instead. So we're gonna want a guess that's gonna look like this. I P is between 16% and 24%. So instead of just saying it's this one number, you're gonna give me a range of values instead. This is the kind of guess we want because we're gonna have a higher chance of being right. If someone calculated P, if someone cal got all the data, population data and calculated P and they found out it was 23%, when you said it was 20%, you were wrong. But when you said, I think it's between 16% and 24%, you're right now because it's 23%, you were actually right. So we wanna get the answer for P, we wanna get it right, okay? So to get it right, we're gonna to have to sacrifice a couple of things. And one thing is, 
instead of me giving just a one number guess, we're gonna wanna, we're gonna get a range of values. So that's the idea. So for today, we're trying to guess P, it's a percentage um, that you can only calculate and know for sure if you had the population data, but you don't. So you take the sample data, calculate P hat, that's your best one number guess for P, but we don't want just a one number guess, we want an interval guess. That's the goal for today. Let me go ahead and click through a few things here. It says the best point estimate for P is P hat. Remember, P is what I'm trying to guess. This is my best guess for it. My best point estimate guess, my best one number guess. But we don't like point estimates because it's only a one number guess. It's almost always wrong. We don't want to be wrong. So how do we fix the problem? We're going to want an interval estimate, an interval guess, a range of values, okay, instead of one value. We want an interval estimate, a range of values so that our answer has a better chance of being correct. So that's what we want. Okay, now, on the other hand, we don't want the interval to be too big. Um, let me give you a, a different example. Let's say you own an energy drink vending machine, energy drink company, okay? And you want to take energy drink vending, you want to put energy drink vending machines on Rio Hondo College's campus. Well, but you don't have too many to go around, so you want to know, um, is it worth it? So you want to know the percentage of all Rio Hondo students that drink energy drinks. Is it a lot of them that drink it? Then it's not a waste of time. If it's not that many that drink energy drinks, then maybe you should just take your energy drink vending machine somewhere else. So you're trying to answer a question, but you don't want to ask every single Rio Hondo student to figure it out. Now, if someone says um, P is between 0% and 100%, this is a very big, wide interval we don't want such a wide interval because, okay, you're definitely right. And you could do that for every problem, right? You could say P is between 0% and 100%. You'll definitely be correct that P is between 0% and 100%. Because every percentage that we look at in a stats problem is always going to be between 0% and 100%. So you definitely have the right answer now. But what's the bad thing? I still don't know if I should take energy drink vending machines and put it on Rio Hondo College's campus. I don't know. Is it a lot of people or not that many people that drink energy drink? Uh, energy drinks. So let's make sure this is clear. We don't like point estimates. It's a one number guess. We're almost always wrong. We want an interval estimate instead, but it we don't want the interval to be too big because even though we can guarantee having the right answer, we will not have learned anything about the population we're studying or the question we're trying to answer. We won't have learned any valuable information about the question we're trying to answer. So we want to compromise, okay? We want an interval, but we don't want it to be too big. So not too small, Think of a point estimate as like the smallest possible interval, just one number interval. And then we don't want it to be too big either. We want to compromise. And the compromise is going to come, uh, it's going to be called a confidence interval when we make this compromise. The sacrifice we're going to make is we're going to be okay with not knowing for sure if we have the right answer in our interval. Okay, so we're going to make an interval guess of P. And we're not going to know for certain that we've captured P, that P is in our interval, okay? But we're going to have a very high chance of ending up with an interval with the right answer in there. And that's why we had to do probability because, it, the, you know, our answer depends on chance, okay? So we get our answer, we get our interval, and we have a high chance that the right answer is in there. There's a high probability that we'll end up with an interval with the right answer for P in it, but we're going to be okay with not knowing 100% that we have the right answer for P in our interval. Okay, so every interval that we're gonna calculate is gonna have a probability attached to it. This is called the confidence level. This is the probability that we'll end up with an interval with the right answer in it. Normally when you build a confidence interval, it's gonna be, there's gonna be a very high probability next to it. They're gonna say, find a 90% confidence interval or a 95% confidence interval or 98% confidence interval. It's not gonna be 100% confidence interval but it's going to be very high probability. So what basically what that means is when you're done and you calculate the interval, there's a very high chance you ended up with an interval with the right answer in it, but it's possible your interval does not have the right answer. You're going to be okay with that because we have a super high probability of ending up with the right answer for P in our interval. And this is the sacrifice you have to make if you don't collect data from the entire big group. If you only collect data from a sample, then you're just going to have to be okay with not knowing for certain that the right answer is your interval, but you had a, you're pretty certain, almost for sure, but not for sure, that you have the right answer in your interval. Okay, the interval is called the confidence interval, and I'm just gonna scribble through this because I don't like the way this is written. 
Um, so let's not worry about that. But so I've said it a couple of times, I'll say it one more time. The confidence level is the probability you'll end up with an interval with the right answer in it. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do today is a couple things. Um, I'm gonna teach you how to build these intervals. I'm, not, I'm gonna show you the formulas. I'm not gonna derive them today. I'm gonna derive them next class um, because it's too much in one day. So for today, I'm just gonna show you how to construct the intervals. And then once we have the interval, let's make sure we completely understand what it means. Okay, like, does it mean for sure we have the right answer in there? No, what does it mean? That kind of thing. Uh, and that'll be the plan for the, to the, for the day. And then um, after that, um, when, we, uh, when I see you guys next time, uh, I'll derive the formulas, let you see where they come from. In the end, everything comes from central limit theorem, which was chapter eight. That's why we had to do chapter eight before we started this chapter. Okay, let's go to this page of formulas. Again, I'm not deriving anything, but for today, we're trying to estimate a percentage. There's a percentage involving a big group we're trying to figure out. Our best one number guess for P is P hat. This is our best one number guess. But we don't want a one number guess, we want an interval guess. So what you're gonna do, after you get your best one number guess, you're gonna have to calculate this thing called the margin of error. Don't let the name scare you or anything. You just calculate this E, which I'll show you how to do. Once you've figured out this number here, you're gonna take your best one number guess and subtract this, you know, your best one number guess and add this and you're gonna get your interval. Like let's say your P hat was 20% and let's say your E was 4%. What you're gonna do is you're gonna do 20% minus 4%. That's what it says here. Take your P hat and you minus your E. 20% minus 4%, that would be like 16%. Then you would add them 20% plus 4%. That would go on this side. That's what it says here, add them. And you would say, I think P is between these two numbers. That's it. So once you have your best one number guess, you add and subtract the margin of error. When you subtract, you get the smaller number in your interval. When you add, you get the bigger number. And you say, I think P, this is a better guess for P. You're guessing that P is between these two numbers. This, that's the idea. So you just have to find the margin of error. Now the margin of error, notice this formula has the Z with a little subscript in it. That's why I had to teach you what that was first. And there's a little alpha in there. And this is alpha here. Alpha is one minus the confidence level. Okay, let me say just one more quick thing and then we'll do an example. I already mentioned to you that the, I'm not deriving the formula today, but this formula comes from central limit theorem. Everything basically for the rest of the semester comes from chapter eight from central limit theorem. Um, section 8.2 for today, because we're doing percentage problems. And so there's a condition, I'm not gonna make you check the condition, but this was the central limit theorem condition. Uh, in order for central limit theorem to apply to P hat, uh, we needed N P Q greater than 10. But unlike chapter eight, P and Q are not known in this chapter. So it's, it changes to N P hat, Q hat, greater than 10. I'm not gonna make you check that on a quiz, but when you're doing online homework, you know, they might ask you to check this. So just, just know that there's this condition here. All right, let's go do a problem. Okay, um, let's read this. So Scott is running for president of the United States. Um, in order to estimate the percentage of voters who will vote for Scott in the election, 1,500 registered voters were polled and asked who they plan to vote for in the election. Of those polled, 811 people said that they were planning to vote for Scott. And then I have all these questions I'm asking you here. Okay, presidential elections is the, probably the number one most common application of stats. Um, the idea is you're trying to figure out who's going to win, uh, who's going to become president by polling. In other words, you don't, you're not going to talk to everybody who's going to vote but you just talk to a few people. Okay, so this is very standard stats kind of question. Now I know in a presidential election, usually there's two candidates or maybe more than two sometimes. Um, and I know there's electoral college and all that stuff, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna simplify it for today. Imagine there's only two people running for president. Scott is one of them. We're just gonna focus on one of the two people. So we're just focusing on Scott. And let's just say he'll be elected if more than 50% of the people vote for him forget electoral college and all that stuff, just to make it a little bit easier. So more than 50% of the people vote for him, he'll be elected. If less than 50% vote for him, he won't be elected and the story's over. Okay, so let's just, let's pretend that just to make the problem a little bit easier. Uh, okay, now, how many people do you have to talk to to know? We have to talk to everybody who's gonna vote, right? In the last election, oh, I forgot now, it was 150 some million people voted. Okay, 150 million. You're not gonna to talk to all 150 million people. That would take you forever. On election day, that's what you do. That's when they're counting the ballots. They're talking basically to everybody who voted. But before then, when you watch the news, they put polls up and they tell you, oh, it looks like 
this person's going to get this much of the vote, whatever. They do the exact same thing we're doing here. They talk to 1,500 people. It's almost always 1,500 people when you look at a poll. Um, I'll, I'll maybe explain a little bit why later on. 1,500 is kind of like a number they like to use. So they talk to 1,500 people only from around the world, or not around the world, I guess around the United States. This is President of the United States. And they're going to ask who you're going to vote for. They all have to get honest answers, of course. Okay. And then from the 1,500, num 1500 answers they got, they're going to guess what percentage of people are going to vote for Scott. Okay, so that's the idea. So they collected 1,500 yeses and nos, even though there's really 150 million yeses and nos. Okay. <clears throat> and just from that, we're going to estimate what's the percentage of people who are going to vote for Scott, and we're going to be almost certain that we got it right. Last couple elections, by the way, polls were way wrong, and that's a whole other issue. But if things are done correctly, then almost all the polls are going to be right. Only a couple of them might be wrong. And again, the issue has to do with, you know, people telling the truth. You know, you might say, oh, I'm voting for one, you know, you might lie or who knows. But let's just assume everyone who you talk to tells the truth. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. I'm voting for this person. Done, you know. All right. Um, so they talked to 1,500 people, asked each one of them if they're going to vote for Scott or not. So they got an a collection of 1,500 yeses and nos. Because they say, are you going to vote for Scott? Yes or no. Also, by the way, when it's a yes or no question, it's a percentage problem. Percentage problems, a dead giveaway for percentage problems is a yes or no question. Of the people that were polled, 811 said yes, they're going to vote for Scott. 811 said yes, the rest of the 1,500 said no. I'm going to ask you all these questions. The first five questions is stuff I asked you first day of class, so I can just ask you that stuff again. But then the last couple of parts have to do with confidence intervals, the new stuff we're learning today. All right, let's go through all this. First of all, someone tell me, what is the population? Can anyone tell me? The population is a collection of all of the people in the U.S. that are voting. All people in the U.S. that are voting. That is correct. I'm going to write it a little bit differently, and my answer is actually going to be worse than yours. Yours is fine. Um, but uh, I'll have to explain, okay, things, okay, let me write this down. Here's what I'm gonna write down. All US registered voters. I'll explain why my answer is not perfect. I'll explain why your answer is not perfect. No, there's no good perfect answer, but you wanna get as close as possible. Um, why is my answer not right? Because, well, first of all, you wanna get the word all in there. Make sure you get the word all in there if you can. All people that are registered though may not vote, okay? So that's why my answer is a little bit wrong, okay? Because if I'm registered to vote, but I don't vote, then I shouldn't be counted in the, in the group because it's only people who are gonna vote uh, that we're counting, right? See what I'm saying? So that's one problem. Um, when you say all people that are gonna vote, what's wrong with that? That's actually correct. That's actually more correct. But here's the problem. If you go to take a poll, you got to know for sure that person's going to vote. How do you know? You know, if you go talk to someone, hey, are you going to vote for Scott or not? Um, that person might be registered. They might tell you they're going to vote for him or not vote for him, but then they might not vote. So that's the problem. You never know. So, so it, anyway, if you get really picky, there's no good answer for party. So we'll go with, again, I'll just say all U.S. registered voters. Um, if you write all people who will vote on election day, that is more correct except there's a little bit of a problem with how do you know for sure you're polling from just those people? That's a little, so anyway, a little bit of an issue. Um, now, let me mention a, an answer that's wrong. Okay, sometimes I'll get this answer. All US registered voters, who will vote for Scott? That would be wrong. Because if you mentioned that we'll vote for Scott, then you're only talking about the people who are gonna say yes to your question. But the population is gonna have people that are gonna say yes and people that are gonna say no. Okay, so don't just say that will vote for Scott. That would be wrong. Okay, that's the end of my discussion on that one. The sample, what's the sample? The selected group of people that you will be asking who they will be voting for. Okay, can you tell me how many people are in that group? Uh, 1,500 registered voters. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just want to make sure because sometimes people will say 811, and I'm like, okay, so let's make sure we understand what group we're talking about. So just to make it a little bit shorter, I'm going to write the 1,500 registered voters. 
you're exactly right what you said. Yours was a little bit longer, but it's totally fine. Uh, okay. And again, a wrong answer here would be the, the, the registered voters that will vote for Scots, okay? Or the 811 people who will vote for Scott. The sample, again, just like the population, will have some people that will say yes to your question, some people that will say no. If you say that will vote for Scott, you're only looking at the yeses now. Okay, so it's got to be both. There's going to be both in there. All right, let's go to part C. What's the population parameter? Okay, so today we're trying to figure out a percentage. Uh, we're trying to figure out the percentage of people that are going to vote for Scott. The population parameter, the symbol is P. This is the letter we're trying to figure out today. The description, whenever you describe a percent, you always describe it in three parts. First, you're going to write the percentage of... Anytime you describe a percentage in words, the first thing you write is a percentage of. Then remember that percentages compare the size of two groups. So you have to now mention two groups to me. So it's a percentage of, now you got to mention the population, all these people, it's a percentage of all US registered voters. Then you have to mention the part of them that will that will say yes to your question. So every time you're figuring out a percentage, a percentage compares the size of two groups. If you imagine this big circle is the population, and a percentage problem, the population is divided into people that say yes and people that say no. So when you're describing a percentage, you, you mention two groups. First, you have to mention the entire population. That's one group, which is all US registered voters, okay? Then you got to mention just the part of the population that will say yes to your question. So we're comparing the size of this big group to this to the part that say yes. Okay. And who are the people that are going to say yes? The people that are going to vote for Scott. So percentage of all U.S. registered voters who will vote for Scott. Okay. That's how you do that. And then you're not going to figure out the answer because we don't have the data to calculate it. So that's all you do there. You just give me the symbol and you describe it in words. Let's go to part D. What's the sample statistic? Okay. So the symbol for the sample statistic is P hat. When you describe it in words, you can describe it the same way you describe the population parameter, uh, except it has to do with the sample now. So remember, uh, when you describe a percentage in words, you just say it in three parts. First thing you're going to write down is the percentage of and now you got to tell me you got to describe two different groups. Imagine this circle here represents the sample, smaller circle. Again, for a percentage problem, the sample is divided into people that say yes and people that say no. So you describe the two groups. First you describe the entire sample which is these people. So the percentage of these people, percentage of the 1500 polled registered voters. And then you describe just the part of the sample that say yes. Again, percentages always compare the size of two groups. You mentioned the entire sample, then mention just the part that say yes, who are gonna say yes, the people that will vote for Scott, the 1500 poll registered voters who will vote for Scott. Okay, so the second line there is one group, and this third line here is the part of them that will say yes to the question. All right, then it says find the value. So we want the answer. What is this percentage? So we can calculate this because we have the data. The bottom number is always how many people you talk to total, which is 1500. The top number is how many people were. How many people said yes to the question, which is 811? I'm gonna just calculate this on the calculator real quick. Just divide 811 by 1500. And I'm gonna, so as a decimal, this is 0. 0.5407. As a percentage, it's 54.07%. Usually when it's a percentage problem, I like to write as a percentage. And I usually like to go, if you write as a decimal, I like to go to four numbers after the decimal. You can go more if you want, but you shouldn't go less. So at least four numbers after the decimal. And so that way, when you write as a percent, percentage, there's two digits still after the decimal there. Okay, that's part D. Now, part E, what's your best point estimate for the population parameter? What's your best guess for this, best one number guess? My best one number guess for that is this. 
And the way I showed you how to write that first day of class, you would write P is approximately P hat, which is 54.07%. So you're guessing. So the, so the, from the people you talk to, 54.07% of them are going to vote for Scott. But I don't want to know the percentage of the people you talk to that are going to vote for Scott. I want to know the percentage of all registered voters that are going to vote for Scott. And you're guessing that that's also 54.07%. So if you're right, then that would mean he's going to get elected because it's more than 50%. But are you right? It's a point estimate. It's almost for sure wrong. Okay. It might be close. It might be far, but you know, you're almost for sure wrong. So we're going to go a step further now. And that's what the point of the lecture today is is I don't want a one number guess for P, I want an interval guess, we want a range of values so we have a higher chance of being right. Any questions on part A through E before we do the stuff, the new stuff, any questions so far? Okay, here, find a 98% confidence interval for the population parameter. Okay, so again, I don't wanna say I think P is 54%, I wanna give a range of values instead. Now, the way I do this, I do this in three steps. First thing you're gonna do, basically what you need to do is you need to take your P hat answer, you need to add and subtract the margin of error and that'll give you your interval. So I have to find the margin of error. The margin of error formula has a Z alpha over two in it. So we're gonna do it in three steps. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find Z alpha over two. Then I'm gonna find the margin of error, then we'll find the interval. So I kind of just do it in three steps. Okay, so Z alpha over two first. Here's how this is going to go. You write down that alpha is 1 minus the confidence level. The confidence level is the probability they give you. This is They're asking for a 98% confidence interval. So 98% is the confidence level. Write it as a decimal. So this is 1 minus 0.98. Alpha is 0.02. So you find alpha. Then you divide it by two. You always divide by two because it says alpha divided by two here. Alpha, basically what I'm trying to do, oh, sorry. Um, I'm trying to find what the subscript is. Sorry, this thing's not moving. Hold on one second. There we go. Remember, we're learning Z, we learned how to find Z with the number on the bottom. The number on the bottom is alpha over two. So I'm trying to figure out that first. So alpha is one minus the confidence level and you divide that number by two. So you take the 0 0.02 and divide by two. Always divide by two because that's what it says in the formula. So I'm looking for Z, the subscript is alpha over two. That means this is the subscript. We're looking for Z 0.01. Okay, I'm gonna have to erase some stuff in a minute, but let me draw a picture first. Remember, this is how you find Z 0.01, just like we did at the beginning of class today. Draw Z distribution, zero, label it Z distribution. The number Z 0.01 is over here somewhere. What I know about it is if you go from there up to the curve and shade to the right, the area that I just shaded is the subscript 0.01. Okay. Then uh, what you do is you find the area to the left by doing 1 minus 0 0.01, 0 0.99. So you look for 0 0.99 in the middle of the Z table. Let me pull up the Z table. We're really looking for 0 0.9900. And if it's not there, we'll pick the closest one. Uh, here, here's 0 0.9901. That's a little bit bigger than 0 0.99. And there's a number a little bit less than 0 0.99. So 0 0.9900 is not there. So you pick the closest one. Which one's closer, 0 0.9898 or 0 0.9901? Which one's closer to 0 0.9900? 0 0.9901. 0.9901. So this is the one we're going to use. It's only one away. The other one is two away. Okay, so we use that. So you go to the right, get the 2.3, you go up, get the other three. So the answer is 2.33 for that. Okay, so that's the first thing you do. You have to look up the Z alpha over two. Okay, this is 2.33. I'm going to erase the picture in a minute. Make sure on the quiz you draw the picture. Any questions on that much? All right, sounds good. So then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna find the margin of error. Let's erase this picture. And then the margin of error formula is Z alpha over two, square root of P hat Q hat over N. 
guys, in a few minutes, uh, when we do our second example, you're going to need to calculate this interval on your own because everyone in here is going to get their own interval. So please make sure you understand how I do it because I'm only really doing one and you're going to have to do the second one on your own. So the Z alpha over two is this. So this part here is the 2.33. So I'm going to copy that down. And then I'm going to open up this root over here. And okay, here it says P hat. P hat is on my previous slide. It was 54.07%. But I don't advise you when you're calculating to write as a percent. So I'm going to write as a decimal, right? 0 0.5407. Let me go back to slide here. Okay, so I'm using this answer. You could use the fraction answer if you want. That's actually better because it's not rounded, but you can use this if you want. I don't advise you to type it in as a percentage. I advise you to type it in as a decimal or as a fraction. Uh, okay, 0 0.5407, that's p hat. To find q hat, you just do one minus p hat. So this number here is gonna be 0 0.4593. Again, where are we getting this number? I'm doing one minus 0 0.5407, one minus this. Okay, and that gives you 0.4593. So once you know p hat, q hat is one minus that. And then n is your sample size. We talked to 1500 people. Now, if you have your calculators out, you should calculate this right now. I'm gonna go ahead and calculate it too. But here's the deal. This is what I advise you to do when you're calculating it. First thing I would do is calculate whatever is inside the root. So just that much. Let me do that much and I'll tell you what I'm getting on my calculator. So 0 0.5407 times 0.4593 divided by 1500. So I'm getting some kind of ugly number on my calculator it says 1.6556234 E negative four. If that E negative four bothers you, don't let it bother you. But that's what I'm getting, 1.6 something E negative four. Then you gotta take the square root of that. And the way you take the square root of that is you do second square root, second answer. We learned that a while ago. If you want to take the square root of your previous answer, just do second square root, second answer. The answer to that I have is 0 0.01286713. So 0 0.012 something or other. And then don't forget, after you get that answer, multiply by 2.33. A lot of people forget the number in the front. I don't know why. But just now do times 2.33. And now in my calculator, it says 0 0.029980035, something like that. And if you round to four digits after the decimal, it's going to become 0. Uh, 0.0300, which is 3%. Because when you go to the fourth decimal, the nine, the next digit's an eight. So you're supposed to add one. It makes all those zero, turns it into 0. 0.03. That's the margin of error, 3%. Calculate it with decimal. I like to do calculations with decimals and fractions. But if it's a percentage, in my final answer, I'll write it as a percentage. So p hat is a percentage, and margin of error is also a percentage. Any questions on the margin of error part? Okay, and then the third step is to write down the interval. Okay, so what you can do is you're going to do, you can take your p hat answer, which was on the previous slide, and you're going to subtract the margin of error. You're going to take your P hat answer and you're going to add the margin of error. And you're going to write that you think P is between. That's how, that's a notation for between. You think P is between these two answers. P hat was 54.07%. Now you're going to minus 3%. Other side, you're going to do 54.07%. Plus 3%. You're going to add and subtract and you're going to add. So you get 51.07% on the left and 57.07% on the right. And that is your first confidence interval. It's a big deal. Okay, this is real life stats problems. People do this all the time. Any questions so far? So if someone says, what's the percentage of all registered voters who are gonna vote for Scott? Your best one number guess is 54.07%, but you're probably wrong. Someone says, no, 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 I don't want a one number guess. I want, an, I want a 90, what was it? 98%? I want a 98% confidence interval. In other words, I want to have a, a, an interval guess instead of a one number guess, and I want to be 90% confident that you have the right answer. Then you say, okay, 
I think the percentage of voters who are going to vote for Scott is between 51% and 57%. That's a much better guess because it's a whole, it's, you're not sticking, to, you're not it's just saying it's this one number, that's it. It's, it's some, I don't know what the number is, but it's somewhere between 51.07% and 57.07%. That's a much better answer for a bunch of reasons. First of all, that, that's a lot of answers, not just one answer. So we have a higher chance of being right now. Okay. And since it's a 98% confidence interval, we have a 98% chance of, that we ended up with an interval with the right answer in there. And if you believe your interval, is Scott going to get elected? The answer is yes, because if P is between 51 and 57, it's definitely more than 50. And if it's more than 50, he's going to get elected. We talked about that at the beginning. So you see, I can answer a question. I can go, oh, it looks like he's going to get elected. Okay. Uh, we have to talk about what the confidence interval means. It's very important you understand when you do stats what the meaning of things are. Turns out years and years ago, I think it was in the 70s or whatever, people were doing all sorts of stats problems in the social sciences and publishing papers, and they were all incorrect conclusions because they they knew the formulas and all this, but they didn't really know what the meaning was. So we need to understand what the meaning is. Do I know for certain that Scott will get elected? The answer is no, I don't know for certain. Basically, when you build a confidence interval, you pretty much believe that the number you're guessing is between the numbers you have in your interval. So I'm pretty certain that P is between 51 and 57%. Am I 100% certain? No, I'm 98% certain. What does that mean I'm 98% certain? So we gotta talk about what that means. And when you're doing the online homework, they're gonna ask you that kind of question. And the answer that, that you have to put for the online homework, I really hate it. So do it for the online homework, but on a quiz, you're gonna give me a better answer. So they'll ask you, what does the 98% confidence will mean? You'll say you're 98% confident that, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. But what does that mean you're 98% confident? What does 98% confident mean? That's what I want to talk about. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, we'll go to part G now. Part G says, what does the 98% mean in a 98% confidence interval? Okay, 98% is a probability. Okay, it's a probability. Whenever you're talking about a probability, you're supposed to say if you do something many times, right? We've talked about meaning of probability before. You do something many times. For confidence intervals, you got to say if you build many confidence intervals. It's like you build an interval, then you do it over and over and over again. You build many intervals. How many confidence intervals did we build? The answer is we built one interval today. Okay. But if instead of building one, you built many, what do I mean? Well, we took a sample of 1,500 people and we did this work and we got an interval. If you now take another sample of 1,500 people and get another interval, Take another sample of 1,500 people and get another interval and keep doing this. So you get many confidence intervals, not just the one that we got. If you build many confidence intervals, then what's going to happen is about 98% of these intervals, 98%, will have the right answer for P in them. But 2% will not. Okay. So if you build many intervals, about 98% of the intervals will have the right answer for P in them, about 2% will not. Let's go ahead and write that much down. And this is how you're gonna write it when I ask you on a quiz, what's the meaning of the 98%. So basically you write it like this. If you take many samples, use them to build many, 98% confidence intervals. Remember, every confidence interval comes from a sample. So you take a sample, you do the whole calculation that we did, and you get your interval. If you do that over and over again, so take another sample, another confidence interval, another sample, another confidence interval. If you take many samples and build many 98% confidence intervals, uh, what will happen? About 98% of the intervals. We'll have the right answer for P. We're trying to guess P. We'll contain the correct answer. For P. Not all of them though. Some intervals, P will not be between the numbers you end up with. But most of them will. So if you build a whole bunch of intervals, most of them will have the right answer. P will be between the two numbers you got and only a couple of them will not. 
okay? But the problem is when you build an interval, you don't know which one you got. Did you end up with an interval where P is be actually between the two numbers you ended up with, or did you end up with one of the bad intervals? Did you end up with a good interval or a bad one where P is not between the numbers that you got? You never know. That's the problem. It's a small problem, but that's a problem. About 90% of the intervals will contain the correct answer for P and about 2%. I'm getting the 2% by doing 100% minus 98%. About 2% of the intervals will not contain the correct answer. So that's what you're going to write. When you write it, make sure you say about 98% of the intervals. I don't want you to write about 98% of the time. Okay, it's very important. It's about the intervals. So almost all of the intervals that you end up with will have the right answer and only a couple of them will not. Okay, I'm going to explain this one other way. Uh, the second way is you're not ever going to write this down, but this is kind of like how I want you to think about it. Because I want you to get really, I want you to really understand what this, what confidence interval means, what's happening here. Okay, so imagine I did this over and over again, okay? So I talked to 1,500 people, built an interval, and I write it on an index card. Then I talked to another 1,500 people, build another interval, write it down on another index card. I do this over and over again, and I put all these index cards in a bag. This is a bag filled with confidence intervals. Okay, like this one says, P is between these two numbers. And then I have another one, P is between some other numbers. And on and on. There's so a ton of confidence. There's millions and billions and trillions of confidence intervals. When you build one interval, it's like you're drawing one time out of this bag of intervals. So we have a bag filled with intervals and you're drawing one time out of this bag. I told you every problem is about drawing once out of a bag, but this bag has lots and lots of intervals. What do I know about the bag? 90% of the intervals have the right answer for P. 98% uh, contain P. 2% do not. If there was such a bag in front of you, well, almost every interval in there, 90% of them, almost all of them, have P in the interval, but only 2% do not have P in the interval. And I say you're gonna select one interval out of the bag. You should put your hand in the bag and select one index card. Do you think you're gonna end up with an interval that has P in it or one that doesn't? What do you think? With one that does. One that does, because almost all of them have P in the interval. Is it possible you ended up with an interval that doesn't have the right answer for P? Possible, but unlikely. Possible, but unlikely, that's right. So when you build an interval, you pretty much believe that P is in your interval because most of the, most likely if you're in this situation, you're gonna end up with an interval with P in there. Is it possible when you built your interval, P is not between there? Sure. It's just, you had kind of bad luck kind of thing. Your sample that you selected produced a bad interval. That'll happen very, not very often, but it could happen. Okay, so that's the deal. So whenever you get a confidence interval, you pretty much believe that P is between the numbers you ended up with. But if someone later on calculates P and says, hey, just so you know, P was not between the numbers you came up with, you'd be like, okay, then that just means when I selected an interval out of this bag, I got unlucky. I, I selected one of the intervals that doesn't have P in there, that's all. So that's the idea. It's like selecting out of a bag filled with intervals. It's like playing roulette, okay? If you're gonna play roulette, Think of it as if it ball lands on green, that's like a bad interval, okay? So it's not gonna land on green very often. There's not, there's only a couple of greens, but it could. So if you're gonna make a bet that it's not gonna land on green, you're probably gonna win. But what if it lands on green, you're gonna lose, that could happen. So you see what I'm saying? It's almost like gambling. Building confidence is kind of like gambling, except you have a real high chance of winning, 90% chance of winning. So whatever interval you end up with, you have a 90% chance you've got the right answer for P in the interval but it's possible you didn't get the right answer for P and interval. Any questions on example two? Okay, let's go to example three. Okay, so what we're gonna do now in this next example, each, every person here is gonna get their own sample <clears throat> and you're gonna build your own confidence interval because I want you to get the idea that if you build many intervals, some of them will have the right answer and some of them will not. Normally, if this was an in-person, face-to-face class, 
what I do is I hand out a, a box that has a bunch of beads in it. Let me read the question first and then I'll explain. So it says a bag contains two types of beads, pink beads and clear beads. In order to estimate the percentage of pink beads in the bag, you draw a sample of size 50. So I usually pass around a, a, a box. Inside the box, there's beads. Some are pink, some are clear. And your, my goal is for you to figure out what's the percentage of pink beads in the bag or in the box, okay? I, there's too many beads to take them all out. There's like, you know, thousands of beads. Um, but I know the percentage of pink beads because I made the bag, you know, so I made it, so I know. But you guys don't know, so you're going to guess it. And then after you guess it with your interval, I'm going to see how many of you have the right answer in your interval and how many of you don't. That's the idea. So I would pass this box around and everybody would take 50 beads out of the bag. There's a real easy way to do that, but unfortunately we're not, we're going to have to do it a little bit different today because I, I can't come to your houses, you know, and bring the box over kind of thing. So we're going to simulate it on the computer is what's going to happen. But you would draw 50 beads out, you'd count how many are pink, and then you would answer these questions. So everybody takes their own sample and you would get your own amount of pink beads in the, in the bag and so on. All right, so here's what I need everyone to do. So we're gonna go to my website. As soon as my computer cooperates, give me a second here. Okay. Everybody go to my website, gregsruhanamathpage.com and click on our class. I'm gonna do that too in a second. Okay, so click on our class, click on miscellaneous. So scroll to the bottom, click on miscellaneous. And there's a link here that says beads app. So I need everybody to click on that, which means you're gonna fill in this information with your own information. Let me do that real quick. So um, just type in my own stuff here, but type in your stuff, type it in correctly. Okay, and then, you're just going to click this one time where it says draw beads. Okay. Let me go ahead and do that. So you see what's happening here. And it just had you simulate drawing 50 beads out of this box that has uh, pink beads and clear beads. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to figure out the percentage of, you're going to estimate the percentage of pink beads in the entire bag. Now all the answers are here. So when you're done, don't X this out. Okay. But everyone has to build their own interval. So once you've clicked that, the interval answer you should have got is down here. So calculate it and make sure you get that answer. I'm going to go ahead and do it for the numbers that are here, but everyone has their own numbers. Let me see real quick. How many pink beads do we have? Three, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13. It also says it here, 13, in case the picture doesn't load right. I ended up getting 13 pink and the other 37 were clear. Okay. So let me show you how this is going to go. But again, everyone has to do it kind of on their own because everyone has their own amount of pink beads and clear beads. I'm going to skim through the first couple of parts of this because I want to get to the last part, which is the most important part. But real quick, let me just go through the first few. What's the population? The population is all beads in the bag. And the sample is the 50 beads I selected the bag. The population parameter is the percentage of all beads in the bag that are pink. Sample statistic is the percentage of the 50 beads I selected that are pink. Now, at this point, everyone's gonna get their own answer. For me, the answer is 13 over 50. 50, everyone's bottom number is 50, but the top number is how many pink beads you got. Bottom is how many beads you selected total. Top is how many said yes, how many are pink. So this is on the calculator 0.26. As a percentage, it's 26%. But everyone has their own answer here. Okay, so everybody calculate their own answer there. For part B, what's your best guess for P? 
My best guess for this P is approximately P hat, which is 26%. But again, everyone's gonna get their own percentage there. Okay, anyway, so just understand that this stuff that's circled, everyone's gonna get their own answer. Some of you might get 26%, but some of you might not. So you're gonna get whatever, depending on how many pink beads you got. Is everybody clear on part D? So this, this number here, everybody clear? Okay, I'll take that as a yes, let's move on. Uh, find the 90% confidence interval. Okay, so again, I'm gonna do some of this kind of quick. First thing you do is you find Z alpha over two. So the way you do that is you write alpha is one minus the confidence level. The confidence level is this percentage, but write as a decimal. So it's one minus 0.90. Then you divide it by two, always divide it by two. This number that I'm getting here, 0.05, is gonna be the subscript on the Z. So we have to look up Z alpha over two. We just have to look up Z 0.05. Now, because we did it earlier today, I'm just gonna write down the answer. It was example one, part E, okay? So let me put some dots here, meaning you're supposed to draw a picture and all that, but because I already did it earlier today, example one, E. Okay, so check that out later to make sure you know how to do that. So everybody should have that answer. Then you find the margin of error. The formula is Z alpha over two squared of P hat Q hat over N. So Z alpha over two is 1.645. But now your P hat and Q hat depend on what your, uh, how many pink beads you got. Like my P hat was 0.26, right? It was 26%. But whatever yours was, put it there. One minus that goes here, 0.74. So these numbers, 0.26 and 0.74, are going to be different for everybody in here. Okay. Whatever your P hat answer was from part D, put P hat there, do one minus that, put it there. Sample size is 50. Everyone's going to get a 50 there, square root of that. Everybody calculate your margin of error. And again, the way you do that is you figure out what this answer is 0.26 times 0.74 divided by 50. Take the square root and then multiply by 1.645. My answer is 0 0.1020. If I write that as a percentage, it's 10.20%. Everybody's margin of error is going to be somewhere between like 9 and 12%. So if it's much lower than 9, like if you get, when you calculate, if you get something like 6% or something, then I think it means you didn't multiply by the 1.645. Please don't forget to do that. But, but don't expect to get this exact answer. It depends on your sample. So any in the, if it's close to 10%, you probably did it right. And then again, to get the interval, you're just gonna subtract P hat minus E and you can do P hat plus E. My P hat, so again, everyone has their own interval. Mine is 26% minus 10.20% here. And you would add on the other side but again, your, whatever your P hat is minus whatever your margin of error is, and then add on the other side. So you get 15.80% um, here, and this is 36.20% there. So there's my guess, okay? That the percentage of pink beads in the entire bag is between these two numbers. So that's my guess. But again, everyone's gonna have their own guess. Okay, so what I wanna do, um, I'm gonna pause the video here and I'm gonna, actually, let me, let me not pause the video just yet. Let me check my answer first. All right, what's going on? Okay, that's good. So I can check my answer because the answers are on the website. So. What is it, 36.20? Okay, 36.20. So see, so all your the answers you should have gotten are here for your sample, your P hat, your margin of error, your confidence interval. That's what I got there. Okay, so what we're gonna do in the last couple minutes here is I'm gonna build many intervals. I'm gonna, let me click the pause recording here. Okay guys, so in this problem, we were finding 90% confidence intervals. And here are your confidence intervals. Um, and again, there's only four students in here today, so you, your, your four intervals are in there, but then I built a whole bunch of other ones. Um, 
And now I'm going to go through them and just check to see which ones actually have the right answer for P in them and which ones don't. And remember what's supposed to happen since these are 90% confidence intervals, 90% of them are supposed to have the right answer. I'm just going to go in through the, and see which ones do not have the right answer. Um, actually, okay, so these are all okay. Oops. This one has it, this one has it, this one has it. This one does not have it. Um, well, this one definitely doesn't have it. Okay. Again, you don't know what P is, but I know what it is, so I can check to see if your in the interval you ended up with has the right answer in it or not. This one does not. Because that's just the nature of the game. When you build the interval, most of them will have the right answer in there. So when you build one, you don't know which one you got. Did you get one that doesn't have the right answer? Did you get one that does? Do you, do you, did you get one with a check mark or one that doesn't have a check mark? You never know. But most likely you got one with a check mark because so many of them have a check mark. What I want to do is I want to calculate what's the percentage of intervals that have the right answer in here. So let me see how many intervals we have total. Six, 10. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. Okay, we've got 29 intervals total. How many have the right answer? Let's see how many have the wrong answer. How many do not have the right answer? One, two, three, four. So 25 of these intervals have the right answer. So if we do 25 divided by 29 to see what percentage of our intervals have the right answer, you get 86%. So 86% of the intervals that we calculated have the right answer. What was this percentage supposed to be? 90%. We're building 90% confidence intervals. Why isn't it 90%? Because we only built 29 intervals. You have to build many intervals. So instead of 29 intervals, if we built thousands and millions of intervals, then this number is going to be almost exactly 90%, meaning almost exactly 90% of the intervals will have the right answer for P in them, and almost exactly 10% will not. So that's the idea. So again, you go through this procedure for building an interval. You never know for sure if you have the right answer, but you're pretty certain that your interval has the right answer in there because so many of them will have it. 90%, about 90% of the intervals will have the right answer. And if you end up with an interval that doesn't have the right answer, it just means you had some bad luck when you went to select an interval from the bag, you ended up with one that doesn't have the right answer. All right, any questions? Okay, guys, well, that's the end of the story for today. Study hard.